Hello, this is UU Talks the golden voice of the great Southwest, and welcome to Loafer's Glory, the hobo jungle of the mind. Steve Baker here, who's doing all of this mixing and fancy stuff. The Boersdorf's uh, there with the opening music as usual, and of course that was sailing down my golden river. Uh, Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger. We are here in the studios of KVMR Community Radio, Nevada City, California, where the sign over the door is a quotation from Oscar Wilde: "Perfection is nature's greatest bore." And we're of course in. Nevada City, California. The, uh, just after midsummer, uh, the garden seems to be doing fairly well. Well, I had flies in the corn, but we drank it anyway. No, I. <coughs> you can believe that if you want to. I put in popcorn this year because uh, during the winter, when I put the popcorn by to dry, during the winter, my wife Joanna likes to put the popcorn into uh, mix it in with the pancake batter. Then we stand back and watch those things turn themselves. Well, now, it's been about three years, I guess, that I was invited over to the Western um, Heritage Labor Festival uh, over, by, over on the coast. And um, I understood there was a possibility that PC was going to be there. And I said, yeah, I'd like to come over, but I would really like to do, oh, an hour and 45-minute interview with, with Pete Seeger um, it, to create something for Loafer's Glory. Well, they allowed that was okay, and Pete agreed to it. I went over there, and we did that, uh, a lot of an interview, and then a lot of questions and answers, and I came home with a good dat recording, which I then promptly lost. It was lost for a long, long time, and then finally Chet Gardner, who had also recorded on a uh, digitally, um, just a week ago sent me a CD of the whole thing, so I have it back in my hands, and that's what we're going to listen to now. Most people have heard Pete sing. You're going to hear him talk some here and, and sing some. The questions I asked him all relate to people's songs and the genesis of the folk music revival, uh, the throes of which we are still going through. So why don't we start? Well, let's start out with an old one, 1947, back in the people's songs era, um, a recording of Pete Seeger singing Eyes on You, and then we'll, then we'll begin the interview. We'd like to dedicate this next song to certain gents we've known too long. They've been living down near the Capitol Dome. We thought we'd send them a little word from home, kind of friendly like. Remind them we're still around. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. Everybody shipping from the Union's got his eyes on you. You want to go back to Congress, let me tell you a thing or two. Everybody shipping from the Union got his eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. Everybody shipping from the Union got his eyes on you. You passed a phony housing bill under that Capitol dome. We'll move you right out of Washington. You'll go looking for a home. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. 
Everybody shipping from the union's got his eyes on you. Now, fair employment practices is a thing that's got to be, or you will soon be crawling to an employment agency. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. Everybody shipping from the union's got his eyes on you. You think you've acted smartly with your slave labor bill. Everyone who voted for Taft-Hartley is right on the spot. We've got our eyes on you. We've got our eyes on you. Everybody should be well, on the union. All right, we'll start off with a little song. Praise boss when morning work bells chime. Praise him for bits of overtime. Praise him whose wars we love to fight. Praise him, fat leech and parasite. Amen. <laughs> Which about, that about covers it, you know. Look, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a long time, Mr. Seeger, the, partly because, well, we're part of a movement, and you can see it here. The progressive movement is many, many different things. It's a labor movement, it's a feminist movement, it's a civil rights movement, it's a children's movement, it's a movement to create more democracy instead of less. It has many, many facets to it. All through our recent history, our movements have been singing movements, you understand. The, the music has grown organically within those movements. But we had a folk music revival, and it had a beginning, it had a root where intellectually, where intentionally, people decided they were going to take folk music, traditional music, new songs, and bring them to a much, much wider audience, you see. That's why I'm in the trade that I'm in. That's why many people here who have taken this up as a trade, being a, a go-about, a traveling folk singer with new and old songs, some traditional, some homemade, you see. There are many trades represented in this hall, isn't that right? How many of you can say, that you know the person that created your trade. Because <laughs> he was the first one that I'm aware of that did it, that went about from place to place, big hall, little hall, singing the people's songs, making up songs. Well, I thank you for it. It's been an honorable profession. And, uh, and all of us that are doing it owe you that. I don't look upon myself as having created this. I. I'm a link in a chain, and uh, it's true that in, after World War II, some new things happened, relatively new things, but really, we're part of a long, long chain of people who made up songs about the crises that they were going through, whether a crisis of trying to make a living, trying to uh, fight racism, uh, trying to uh, just to adjust to a new situation. And it's been going on, I think, for thousands of years. I really do. You know, there's an old Arab proverb, when the king puts the poet on his payroll, he cuts off the tongue of the poet. <laughs> and Plato is supposed to have said, it's very dangerous for the wrong kind of music to be allowed in the Republic. And you know the Catholic Church tried to control what kind of songs were going to be sung in churches for a thousand years or more. So I think there have been people like us for a long time. Now it's true, when printing came along, all of a sudden people had songbooks and, and uh, well, for example, during the American Revolution, uh, printers printed up the latest new sets of words to some Yankee tune everybody knew, like Yankee Doodle. and. Uh, Fifty years later, the uh, budding uh, women's suffrage movement, the temperance movement, printed songbooks. This is a, a wordy tradition, though, and very frankly, uh, I feel that some of the best songs are made up by people that didn't write things down. Oh, betcha, you uh, bet. And uh, on the other hand, there's no doubt that when the Wobblies handed out the little red songbook with every union card, and uh, there were 50 uh, men riding on a freight train going through the Midwest, chasing the harvest. Uh, somebody would pull out the little red songbook and they'd sing up a storm, I'm told, on that freight train. So I don't want to put down songbooks, and I've 
been guilty of writing songbooks myself, but still, I have to confess that some of the greatest songwriting has been done by people who really didn't learn songs out of books. They learned that part of the uh, the long memory, yeah. which is the most radical idea in America, and it, it, it it's true. But what happened? Go ahead, excuse me. Well, what happened after World War II? I was in the army in uh, in the fall. I was waiting to be mustered out of the army, and I write a letter to Lee Hayes and said, you know, there's people like us, uh, not just in New York, but out in Chicago there's some, and there's Bill Wolf out in, in uh, Los Angeles and others, and people making up songs in different places. We need a little newsletter to pull us together. It uh, could be mimeographed, and it wouldn't cost too much money to, to get it out. I thought of something that would have a circulation of a few hundred. Uh, when I finally got out of the army in December of 45, got together with Lee and we set a meeting for, uh, in my in-law's house on Greenwich Village. Uh, we had a meeting and decided we'd call this uh, the People's Songs Bulletin. And uh, oh, we had a fancy, we had a fancy first statement. There it uh, is right there. Herbert Halfrecht, who uh, is now in his 80s, still around. The people are on the march and must have songs to sing. Now, in 1946, the truth must reassert itself in many singing voices. There are thousands of unions, people's organizations, singers and choruses who would gladly use more songs. There are many songwriters, amateur and professional, who are writing these songs. It's clear there must be an organization to make and send songs of labor and the American people throughout the land. To do this job, we have formed People Songs, Inc. <laughs> we invite you to join us. We were really kind of silly to put that ink there. Uh, it made people think that we were, we were owning all these songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't think of owning these songs. As a matter of fact, we made the mistake of not copywriting the word hootenanny, and ABC stole it in 1964. <laughs> uh, What's your explanation of that word, by the way? I've heard none. Oh, well, I can tell you pretty accurately. Terry Pettis, who came from Indiana, was a member of the Washington Commonwealth Federation, which helped, which elected, helped elect Hugh DeLacy to Congress in 1944 and re-elected him in 1946. Anybody ever meet or know Hugh DeLacy? Great. He'd been a carpenter, but he became a p politician and a very, very honest one, wonderful guy. He only died a few years ago. At any rate, they wanted to have a monthly fundraising party. They might show a movie, they'd have some good food, some dancing, and some singing. It was a kind of a loose affair, and the people wanted to dance could be in this room, and people wanted to see the movie it was in that room, but everybody ate the food, whether it was crab gumbo or whatever it is they put together. And they had a vote on what to call this, this uh, monthly party, and Hootenanny won out over Wingding <laughs> by a nose. Now, they, uh, uh, Terry Pettis is the one who proposed Hootenanny, and he said in Indiana, he, he knew it just as the name for an unplanned party. It, literally the same thing as the Wingding. Now, where were you last night? Oh, we had a Wingding, we had a Hootenanny. It just meant on the other hand, I can tell you, it, it, Indiana was French territory, and I'm almost personally positive that it has French roots. There were some French students in Cornell found in the 40s found there was going to be a hoot, and they said, what? We said, what's wrong? Well, where I come from, that's when you shoo the bride and groom out into the fields to spend the wedding night. <laughs> uh, however, in 1941, Woody Guthrie and I, uh, calling ourselves Almanac Singers, the other two had gone back east, but we kept on going for a month or so, we show up in Seattle and we hear this word, hey, that's a nice word. And when we got to New York, we used it for the weekly rent party that the Almanac Singers had in Greenwich, Greenwich Village. And uh, we charged 35 cents and every Sunday afternoon we'd have, we, we were the regulars, but we always had guests coming in, sometimes Burr Alive, sometimes Josh White or Lead Belly. And it was a fun, fun Sunday afternoon every week. Then uh, the war came along and the Almanac singers broke up. I went in the Army and Woody went in the Merchant Marine and so on. 
But after the war, uh, we got together with this People's Songs organization. We decided we'd call our fundraising get-togethers Hoot Nannies. Wasn't there a, wasn't there a, a, you were in a group organized by Lomax called the Union Boys? This was just for a record. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't know about Alan Lomax, let me tell you a little bit. He uh, is still alive. He's had a stroke, though, and he's only uh, not as fully alive as he was. Although I'm wishing he's fighting and hoping that if he keeps on fighting in a few years, he'll recover from his stroke. But he can't walk too easy or talk too well now. But in the middle 1930s, he meets my father, a theoretician. And they say, uh, instead of expecting educated people in the cities to write the great new music of the future, let's go uh, pick up on the great music that's already been made and build upon it. And they took his example, Aunt Molly Jackson of Kentucky, who had written The Miner's Wife, Hungry Ragged Blues, and other songs like that. Uh, she came out of an old Scots-Irish tradition, and she used old tunes and put new words to them. And her younger half-brother, Jim Garland, and her younger half-sister, Sari Ogan, also were making up songs. I Don't Want Your Millions, Mister, The Murder of Harry Sims. And they said, build up on this kind of music, and we may get the best new music of the future. Uh, Alan Lomax couldn't persuade his father to put these songs in a book so you had a big stack of, of, of scratchy field recordings and uh, words from various places. And when Woody and I arrived on the scene in 1940, me coming from New England and Woody from Oklahoma, and started working together, Alan says, why don't you make a book out of this? And he tossed several hundred songs at it. And uh, I thought of the title, Hard Hitting Songs for Hard Hit People. Yeah. And... Woody uh, wrote little introductions for the songs. In 1941, we did not get a publisher, but Sing Out magazine in 1964, 66, did get it printed. It's right now out of print, although I hope someday it'll be in print again. But Alan Lomax was a very important person. He said, uh, the music being produced by Hollywood and Tin Pan Alley is 99% phony. Occasionally, a good song comes through, but uh, and you had, you had to admit, after all, Green Sleeves was a pop song of the 17th, 16th century, and Old Dan Tucker was the hit song of 1844, so you can't say that pop songs don't occasionally produce some good songs. But most of them are so insincere and phony, and by contrast, he had these great songs he'd collected all around the country, House of the Rising Sun, and uh, so on, the songs of Lead Belly, uh, Midnight Special, and so on. And Alan said, let's make these America's greatest, fam famous, best-known songs. And when he heard the Almanac singers sing, he says, you may not know it, but you're doing the most important musical job in America. You're showing city people how to sing these country songs. Don't put on airs, just sing them out. Get crowds joining in. And Alan was so persuasive he was very persuasive. He got, he uh, kept us working. He did the same thing with Woody Guthrie. He said, you are a ballad maker. Don't let anything distract you from being a ballad maker. You're like the man who wrote song, the ballad of Jesse James. You're like the woman who wrote the House of the Rising Sun. You're a ballad maker. And Woody took that advice seriously and kept on doing it until he could do it no more. Because it was hard on his wives and children. Very. Uh, uh, Lomax was the uh, editor of the of the. Uh, no, he. Uh, Alan was one of the uh, group that started it. So was John Hammond, the jazz man, and uh, Moses Ash at one time. A lot of other people. Uh, uh, Earl Robinson, a whole batch of people helped us out. But it was mainly Lee and me at first, and then Lee, who was a great writer finds it hard to work in organizations. He said, got to do it right or not do it at all. And he was unwilling to make compromises. And in the summer of 46, I guess, or fall of 46, the whole rest of the organization, Pete, you got to ask Lee to leave. And I did. 
Second time I did it, I think I was a mistake. I should have stuck up for him. Because and then when Irwin Silber became the And editor? then uh, uh, first uh, Felix Landau, then Irwin Silber uh, became the executive secretary and the editor. I was the editor for a while, but I was traveling too much. Wally Hilly, who was a friend of Lee's from the Midwest, very serious, uh, trained musician, who taught, been a professor of music at college, uh, came in, he was our music editor. And it was Wally who in 1948 said, Peter, look at this, uh, these two short verses. I found them in the preamble to the Constitution of the Amalgamated Coal Miners of 1860. Step by step, the longest march can be won, can be won. Mm -hmm. I said, what's the tune? He says, I don't know. I suppose, suppose some old Irish tune would fit it. Maybe like the Praties, they grow small, so we try it. Step by step, the longest, hey, it fits good. And it's been sung to that tune ever since. The uh, letterhead for People's Songs included as a supporting cast Aaron Copeland, Oscar Hammerstein, Lena Horne, Gene Kelly, Dorothy Parker, Ilya Kazan, Paul Robeson, and Josh White. That's a pretty powerful advice. Well, this was mainly Alan's work. He worked real hard, got on the phone with people, and he's persuasive with all these well-known people. I said, well, if you want me to, Alan, I'll do it. But they never actually participated very much, although Robeson participated more than most. When Sing Out, uh, people's songs went bankrupt after three years. We owed all of $3,000 and didn't know how to pay our printer's bills. So uh, I took the whole library and put it in my a uh, child's bedroom, my wife thought the whole stack of, of cardboard boxes would have fallen on his crib. Uh, and a year later, we got Sing Out started, and Paul Robeson came down to uh, give us a send-off in a little loft on 21st Street. And uh, he read, uh, translated from Russian into English, something that had been written about us by a, a Moscow musician, saying, saying uh, these uh, American songwriters are doing a great job and, and uh, keep people, the world should keep our, their eye on them. It was, um, I, I think it probably, it, at least the way I heard it, began to come unraveled. Uh, there was a lot of rank and file activity in 46, 47 in the progressive campaign of, of uh, Henry Wallace, but then the repression, then the, uh, you know, the, the McCarthyism. Uh, Solowski's warning in the newspaper, be vigilant when you hear songs issued by people's songs. Another newspaper said, propaganda designed to destroy the American government by, uh, government by every means usable, including songs. <laughs> People often ask me, what was the influence of the Communist Party on people's songs? I was a member of the Communist Party, not a very good member. I'd, didn't like meetings any more than Woody did. And we used to kid each other about the long words that party people like to use. Uh, I did go and knock on the door of the guy in charge of the cultural section. Uh, he was a movie editor, nice fella. And uh, he said, well, it sounds like a good idea. I think it's wonderful, go ahead and do it. You didn't, that was about the influence of the Communist Party on this. On the other hand, we did read the Daily Worker regularly. I sent. Uh, a copy of a song called Newspaper Men. Newspaper Men meet such interesting people. Burn Parlow. I sent it to uh, Carl Sandberg, and he wrote me a letter of thanks, of thanks, and I kept on sending him uh, the magazine. I met him about 10 years later, 13 years later, said, uh, did you ever sing the song? He said, oh yes, I did, and he, said, he sang it back to me. He'd memorized it. Uh, I, he said, I I look at the magazine occasionally, very party line, <laughs> in his opinion. Uh, the, I don't really remember any big arguments we had about, is this the right politics or is that the right politics? We had arguments about a song, is that a good song or a bad song? Uh, is it a weak song or a strong song? Uh, but there weren't that many disagreements. Mm -hmm. Of course, 1946 was the uh, Truman's Federal Employees Loyalty Act, um, HUAC, the Taft-Hartley or Worker Management Law, 
And um, Phil Murray, president of the CIO, disaffiliated 11 unions, whole unions, because of their uh, left leadership, you understand. Um, and that's, you know, when McCarthyism really, really began to hit. And what was the, uh, at, the, at, the at the time of the Wallace campaign, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, people saw was getting about 50% of his engagements out of the, the Wallace campaign. We dove into that. Uh, again, it was Alan Lomax who was very enthusiastic about Wallace's uh, candidacy and, and uh, got Boots Cassetta. How many of you know Mario Cassetta? From, he was in the army with me and uh, when he got out he dived into helping people's songs and he started People's Songs of California with an office down in Los Angeles. But he came to New York in 48 and manned a desk to see that every political speech had, speaker had a singer along. Michael Loring, great voice, man who first sang The, the House I Live In and, and uh, matter of fact, first sang Joe Hill, I think. And uh, Same old it, Mary go round that's my favorite. Right. Yeah. And what is America to me? Yip Harburg, the man who wrote Over the Rainbow, was enthusiastic for Wallace. He had, uh, he had uh, some songs. I've got a ballad. Magic little ballot. Woody didn't like the song. He said, it's too trivial. This song, this campaign is about serious things. <laughs> and uh, I and some others were trying to sit around and write funny political parodies. And Woody said, why are you guys scared to be serious? <laughs> Not that Woody wouldn't crack a joke, but he, he was, uh, didn't want to be trivial when there's life and death involved. Although we had a great singing convention in, in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, Elmer Rice and some others says, if it was up to the music, this, this campaign would be a, a winner. I guess in 1947, Margaret Mayo, was, that was ASGD, the, the square dance group. Well, she was a school teacher in New York, and in the mid-30s, she started the American Square Dance Group. That's where I met my wife. And uh, she uh, was a, from Kentucky, County Mayo in Kentucky. And her cousin was Rufus Crisp, a great banjo picker. Taught me a lot. Uh, she wasn't that political a person, She'd have her square dance group go to something political, but uh, she'd have them go to churches, too. She had this insight in uh, 1947. Margaret Mayo, quote, folk music is becoming big business. Lurking among these beckoning green pastures is the big time commercial promoter to whom art is very little more than a commodity. Sound familiar? <laughs> good. Where'd you get that? That's a great well, line. Well, uh, I've been, before I got run out of Utah, Pete, uh, you know, uh, after I ran for the U.S. Senate on the Peace and Freedom ticket, my job vanished, my state job. I was a state archivist for eight years. Ah. And I worked for the Historical Society. I managed 75,000 feet of public records, cubic feet of public records. And I'm a, I'm a pack rat. I mean, you, you think you have a problem handling paper where you come to my house sometime. So, it, yeah, I, I hate to tell you. I've just been picking this stuff up all over you for years and years, you know. Well, I got to get that quote from you. Oh, right? sure. Yeah, that uh, Margaret was great. She came around to the Newport Folk Festival and was so happy there to see thousands of young people latching on to this music. It was in um, 1948, December of 1948. Looks <laughs> like telepathy, right? You said at a meeting of uh, of uh, people songs. The continued lack of activity in the labor movement, the still tremendous limitations of audience and participation imposed by monopoly controls of the main channels of communication, 
and the neglect of the whole question of affiliates to and from people's songs. But that's why you were suspending publication of the People's Song Bulletin. Do you recall that? Fancy words. Well, <laughs> they're yours, by God. That was, I guess that was behind the fact that we went broke. <laughs> oh, now that reminds me, there was a, one of the reasons, if I'm not mistaken, come on, Brain, you went, one of the reasons you went broke is you had a store, and Harvey Matuso, who turned out to be an FBI informer, overstocked the damn thing and didn't pay the bills. No. Harvey no, what do you remember came about to Harvey? A, uh, this young fellow comes into People's Song and says, says, you could be selling records here uh, to people who come up into this office. Why don't you let me sit at the door and I'll, and I'll s sell records and so on. We said, well, if you can, we can't pay you, but if you want to do it, fine. And he ordered some records and, on credit. He's already being paid, you know. And uh, he sat at the door, keeping track of who came in and, and went out. And uh, a year later, uh, found out he'd been, he was paid by the FBI to do this. And he also ran up bills which we couldn't f pay. Uh, he t took the money which came in for the records, and we never saw it. Uh, Poor Harvey's still alive. He calls him Job Matuso. He, he got mm. damned by everybody because he tried to make up for it by, by confessing his sins, and, but no one could trust him right or left or in between. March 19, March 11th, 1949. This is your life, Pete Seeger. <laughs> this is, uh, the last issue was published to four pages. But then I've heard about, uh, in New York, a musical tapestry with Ima Sumac, Artie Shaw, and others, and what was des is described as a fledgling weavers. That was the attempt in January 49 to uh, pay off our $3,000 worth of bills. We borrowed money and rented Carnegie Hall, and we had what we thought was a hotshot promoter to plan things. Didn't do such a good job of planning. We did have some famous people on it. Artie Shaw was there with his orchestra. Uh, but uh, we didn't charge enough for tickets, so we didn't sell all of 300 tickets. Although 2,500 tickets were sold, 300 were not sold, and we lost money instead of making it. Remember? But the Weavers were born out of that? No, actually, the Weavers were born in the hoot nannies we had right after the election where Henry to Wallace lost. We had a Thanksgiving hoot nanny, and uh, this new group, it was five people at first, uh, five or six, uh, and then we had a nice Christmas hoot nanny, and this group did itself proud again. I don't remember that we were on the program in 1949, maybe we were, uh, and we, some people had to drop out, we didn't, weren't making any money, mm -hmm. In the summer of 1949, I wanted the Weavers, by this time we had a name, to sing on the Peekskill concert, but we were completely unknown, and, and uh, so the decision would just ask me to sing. And then mm -hmm. Lee and, and uh, Fred and Ronnie sat out in the audience. I sang a few songs before Paul Robeson gave the main concert, September 1949, but the, we were about to break up because we tried we tried renting a little uh, basement place and, and have p people come in. We got all of 60 or 80 people to come in and listen to us at a dollar apiece. And so f Ronnie says, I think I'm going to raise a family. And Fred says, I think I'm going to get me a master's degree and go back to college. And Fred says, I think, and Lee says, I think I'm going to write short stories for Ellery Queen. But I wanted to sing with a group. And I went to Max Gordon, who ran the village vanguard, and said, I've got a group that would like, I think would be good to sing here. He says, no, I'll, I hire you, but I, I don't want a group. I said, I, he'd paid me $200 a week, which was a good salary in those days. Uh, I said, would you pay, would you hire the group if the group only asked $200? <laughs> he laughed. He says, well, if you really want to do that bad, I'll try it. So just before Christmas, we started singing at the Village Vanguard, and Max Gordon was intrigued by us. We were so amateurish in some ways, but so full of enthusiasm in other ways. 
And we did have some good songs. I mean, good night, senna, senna, and a whole batch. And at times in January and February, there were only four or five people in the whole village vanguard. We'd leave the little stage and go sit down with the table and say, let's sing some songs. Uh, but Max didn't fire us. He was intrigued, and the audiences built up and built up by April, where the place was full, that is 120 people. And uh, then a guy came in who, I thought he was drunk. He says, you guys are great. I got to get you on Decca Records. <laughs> Somebody said, hey, Pete, don't you know that's Gordon Jenkins, the famous band leader? I said, who's he? <laughs> a month later, he had us on, on Decca, and uh, the record, Senna Senna, was number one for two weeks, and then he turned the record over, and Irene Goodnight was number one for three months. It was the biggest seller of 1950. You couldn't escape the song. I remember hearing a person in a jukebox say, turn that jukebox off. I've heard that song 50 times today. <laughs> But that's and what I mean, like at the beginning, you know, when I first started out, you're, I, I said it badly, but I, this is what I meant. Now, the, the traditional people, the people like Joe Hill or T-Bone Slim, who were in, directly involved in the struggle and created songs out of those struggles, you see, if they didn't want to do it, they weren't going to go to college to get a master's. They weren't going to write short stories for Ellery Queen's, Ellery Queen's magazine. But I mean, this is a different kind of people who, instead of doing those things, decide to go out and make a living doing music. And, and that's why I say that you, you created the trade, you know, the, 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 the opportunity for many, many of the rest of us to be able to do that. Yeah, I think I show that you could sing in schools, you could sing in summer camps, and you could sing, of course, for an occasional tourist uh, place, a, a summer place up I used to, go, you know, if you heard the term the Borscht Belt, they had uh, summer places up there that would hire a singer. Uh, but you didn't have to go to a nightclub. And when I, uh, when the Weavers were blacklisted, I went to teaching in school, and then I started, uh, some of the kids I'd sung to in summer camp went to college, and uh, Oberlin, they had a little club they called a folk song club. I said, Pete, can you come out here? We'll pass the hat, I'm sure we'll make you bus fare. So I went out, and they did pass the hat, and they did make my bus fare. And next year, I went back and sang for 500 people. And this time, the president of Oberlin uh, invited me in, in for tea. <laughs> I think he was curious, what's this guy up to? But the next year, I came back and sang for 1,000 people in the main auditorium. Uh, that was the year also in which uh, Harvey Cox, who was a young man at the time, asked me to sing for the student Y, and he taught me the student Y has found a new vocation, poisoning the student's mind. <laughs> the leaders by astute manipulation are poisoning the student's mind. I came back the next year, though, and Harvey had been fired. And that, <laughs> that, but the students had a new verse. Uh, uh, William, uh, oh, I can't remember, Stevenson. Uh, Stevenson was a, William Stevenson was the head of Oberlin. Uncle Will has sent away our brother for poisoning the students' minds. But he'll find out there'll always be another poisoning the students' minds. He'd rather, he'd rather have us stick to evening prayers than stop, and stop meddling in national affairs. That doesn't suit the millionaires. We're poisoning the students, poisoning the students, poisoning the students' minds. <laughs> and, I think I also show that you could mix it up. You could sing a, a, a little song, which is a sassy little song, uh, a satire of the day, and you could sing a 500-year-old ballad. Lord Thomas had a sword in his hand. He strode across the hall. He cut his bride's head from off of her shoulder and kicked it against the wall. And then there's little shit, right? <laughs> what you sang last night. I'm proud of that song. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were, you know. Just a, I mean, just uh, yeah. you, you, you sit there waiting for you to be a wise ass and it, it comes true. <laughs> well, I sang it for 3,000 Quakers last summer. Oh, how they, well, they do like, I guess they do. 
I've been told they do. And I sang it at a very proper prep school I went to uh, years ago. And uh, the students and the teachers and the children of some of the teachers, I got them all singing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we eat a little shit. Give me an opinion here. Now, you're just saying that little piece of, I, I don't know what the ballad was, but they're all pretty much the same. Uh, I only encountered those when I left Utah and ran into people like Sarah Cleveland and, and other ballad singers. And it seemed to me that those were songs that were sung by, by peasants, by, by lower class people. And they were warning songs because they talked about and sang about the atrocities of the nobility and that they were really class conscious songs in that, I, in that I sense. I think you're right. To warn their kids away from these uh, assholes who you know, were the, the feudal lords. This is the interesting thing. Of course, there were lit literally thousands, tens of thousands of ballads made up all during the Middle Ages. And some of these singers were really quite professional. They go from castle to castle and sing. And some would be uh, mainly on one the side of one clique and some side of another clique. You and McCall had a book on the, the ballads of the years of Edward the Sixth, something like that. And they were long ballads, 20 verses, 30 verses, 40 verses. On the other hand, a good ballad would get pared down. Uh, you don't need 30 verses if you got seven real good ones. And sometimes they, as they'd bring out Li lines where the the uh, the workers, the people at the bottom, the peasants, won the victory. Like the famous ballad about the knight in armor coming across the girl coming home from the fields and says, well, uh, you're coming with me. And she said, well, help me up onto your horse. And so, uh, so I'll, I'll go with you. And she gets up, up, but she drops something. Oh, I dropped my, my hat, will you get it? So he gets off the horse to get it, and she slaps the horse and goes right, off. Yeah. Goes, Goodbye, fella. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're, we're get, let's get to some more singing now. What, what um, kind of wrapping things up? The, is there a relationship you feel directly between people's songs and the commercial, the folk music revival starting around 1959? What's called the folk music revival was a commercial thing as a result of the success of the Kingston Trio who, and Peter, Paul, and Mary. And suddenly, uh, Broadway, which had been floundering for a decade, the big band era hadn't been bringing in the hits. They tried novelty songs in the late 40s. Mary's he dotes and dotes he dotes, little lambs he dives and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer and so on. <laughs> And as, as far as they were concerned, the Weavers were one more novelty. But all of a sudden, these records were selling again. They thought they'd gotten rid of us. Uh, and uh, they didn't want to take on rock and roll. That was too, that was that, that too sexy. And, 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 uh, and as you know, the uh, conservative uh, white America has been against African music for hundreds of years. Uh, it, that they didn't understand it, they, they uh, were scared of it, and even way back in ragtime days, uh, there were people writing this is dangerous music for our children, it's, it's corrupting our children. And uh, uh, in the 1950s, uh, they couldn't keep Elvis Presley's down, and, they, and rock came in. But then along comes Kingston Trio said, wow, this, this is what we'll get. We'll keep rock out with the King Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary. And then the Newport Folk Festival suddenly made the word folk commercial. And in 1964, it was all over the airwaves with the Hoot Nanny show on radio. But it was really a pretty phony thing. And I was myself very glad when it went, when that period passed. And when people say, to me, oh, wouldn't it be nice if there was another folk music boom? I said, I hope not. But there was a fallout from that. I mean, there were people who picked up the banjo because they were drawn to the Kingston Trio. Most of them gave it up, but some stuck with it and, and learned to become mm -hmm. damn fine traditional banjo players. I, I've made a, a living, not a killing, God knows, playing for folk music societies 
all over the country that were fall out from that uh, commercial right. revival, you know. So there was a residue of people who really got serious about mu our music. Actually, in, when I went down to, to Washington briefly uh, in the, after the success of Irene Goodnight, Harold Spivak, the head of the music committee, said, don't apologize for Irene Goodnight. Uh, this is going to introduce a new kind of music to millions of Americans who, who uh, were either ashamed of it or didn't know about it. However, I still feel I'm, I'm sorry that people thought folk music is something that, uh, that is done with, by some fellow with a guitar on a stage and a woman in a rocking chair singing an old song that she got her, her Italian grandmother taught her. Oh, she's not a folk singer. She's just singing an old song to her grandchildren. But she's the real folk singer, of course. And I've, I've often felt more than a little ashamed that I'm called the folk singer when the real folk singers are just unknown. I think there are more of them. And again, because of the fallout from the commercial folk revival, that it brought in a wave of singer-songwriters. Well, when Holtzman and Electra were going broke and Jerry Wexler uh, shipping rock bands around the country, you know, and not making enough to support them, it was so much easier to get sub-publishing agreements on one person's songs and schlep them around, you know, stand them up in front of a microphone and say, sing. Yeah. It was just more economically uh, sound. But what it proved to some, to lots and lots of people that people had been cast in the role of consumers of music. Though they did it and we consumed it and that was it. Keep your mouth shut and consume it. That first core of singer-songwriters proved to lots and lots of people that you could make up songs and that you could sing them. And they've been doing it ever since. And you know, I know there's a lot of talk about the current wave of singer-songwriters being so self-centered, but I really admire the fact that so many young people are willing to embrace song-making and song-singing as a means of self-expression. And it's going on with young people now, too, in their teens and 20s. Uh, picking up on this, uh, how many of you heard of the songs of Stefan Smith? Uh, his, his song about Abner Louima, the uh, Haitian brutalized by the Brooklyn police. Great song. Uh, he's kind of an anarchist type like you. He doesn't want to copyright anything. He said, I'm just changing around the words of all things. And uh, he's, he, mimic, he uh, Xeroxes copies and gives them to people. Doesn't have his name or address on it. He's a, a very interesting guy, and he should have been here this weekend because he could have contributed a lot to this weekend. But he's off singing somewhere in the East. At the moment, New York is his center. He's written a good song. I got it and sing out in the spring issue. It rose, it rose, it rose from the dead. It rose, it rose, it rose from the dead. And it rose, it rose, it rose from the dead. And my Faith shall carry my spirit on. It's new words to an old gospel song that he heard Blind Lemon Jefferson sing on a record of 1928. But he got a batch of new verses. If anybody should ask you, how did this movement start? If anybody should ask you, how did this movement start? If anybody should ask you, how did this movement start? Well, go and figure. It started in my heart, and it rose, it rose, it rose from the dead, and it rose, it rose, it rose from the dead, and it rose, it rose, it rose from the dead, and my faith shall carry my spirit. I ain't gonna sit back silently no more, ain't gonna sit back silently no more I ain't gonna sit back silently no call cause this is the only thing I'm living my life for and it rose it rose so on good song and uh, hey, oh, we ought to leave it at that that that's just a good place yeah, yeah. well there's others like Stephen Smith uh, so any of you know Casey Neal from Seattle mm -hmm. another young guy good voice and uh, Young men and women all around making up songs. Okay, maybe 999 out of 1,000 will eventually be forgotten. But one of them, who knows, is going to spread around the world the way this land is your land did. Or some other song. Who knows? Thanks, Pete. Oh, it's a question. Oh, you got some questions? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you ask some questions? Oh. 
old devil Old devil time I'm gonna fool you now Old devil time You'd like to bring me down When I'm feeling low My lovers gather round And help me rise To fight you one more time Old devil fear You with your icy hand Old devil fear You'd like to freeze me cold Now when I'm sore afraid My lovers gather round And help me rise To fight you one more time Old devil hate I knew you long ago Then I found out The poison in your breath now when we hear your lies my lovers gather round and help me rise to fight you one more time no storm or fire can ever beat us down no wind that blows but carries us further on and you who fear We can rise and sing it one more time. Try it. No storm or fire can ever beat us down. No wind that blows but carries us further on. And you who hear, all oh, lovers gather round. And we can rise and sing it one more time. Storm or fire can ever beat us down. No storm or fire can ever beat us down. No wind that blows but carries us further on. And you who fear, oh, lovers gather round. And we can rise and sing it one more time.
Well, that was a conversation with Pete Seeger. Thanks for being with us. You've been listening to Gopher's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind, and uh, I am UU Utah Phillips, the Golden Voice of the Great Southwest. Thank you.